Thank you, Peter, and good evening, everyone. And it's wonderful to be here on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and I pay tribute to their elders. And I'm delighted to be here in Sydney today, in part because today is the 36th anniversary of my ordination. So I was able to share a coffee with my fellow ordinand, Father Stephen Astle of the Society of Jesus, and to have a splendid lunch with my 93-year-old 90 father. And so here we are this evening in Sydney uh, to speak a little about observations on the Pell proceedings. What I'm intending to do is to speak for about 40 minutes and then we'll allow a full half hour or more for questions. Any questions that you have, because as you know, I've made very few statements to the media about this issue, because I know that particularly for victims of abuse and bona fide complainants, it can be very hurtful, particularly hearing from Catholic priests. But there is a need for justice, there's a need for truth in order that healing might occur. And I think it's important this evening to lay bare what happened through the Victorian criminal justice proceedings. And I'm delighted that this one and only launch in the city of Sydney can be videoed so that people in Victoria can watch and get an understanding of these things should they wish. Because it's in Victoria that the reforms are needed. It's in Victoria that the public inquiry is necessary. But it won't happen, but it's necessary to highlight the issues which confront us as a nation with a trial of this sort. So, first, how did I come to be involved in observing these proceedings? As Peter has said, and it's probably something of an understatement, Cardinal Pell and I have had our differences, even acute differences, in the past. From my own perspective, things reached a low point when there was a rather humorous biography of the great Roddy Ma produced here in Sydney. And Roddy Ma, as you may know, was a distinguished judge in New South Wales, and he came from a very distinguished family who'd been educated at St Ignatius College, Riverview. So in the biography, he was asked about his view of the Jesuits. And Roddy, in his typical humorous fashion, said that the Jesuits, of course, had changed greatly. He said, now, probably the best known Jesuit is Father Frank Brennan, who is long on witchetty grubs and short on Greek verbs. And I thought that was quite humorous. But the biographer then interviewed Cardinal Pell, who took this as a launching pad to make the dual observation that he thought that the thing with Brennan was that he wasn't really educated in Catholic theology and, furthermore, that the Jesuits tended to replace Jesus Christ with social justice. Now, I wrote to his eminence fairly boldly and said, I thought this time he'd gone too far. Well, he thought I'd gone way too far. So that's where things stood. In 2012, uh, you might recall, we had a situation where there were growing calls for some sort of national commission of inquiry into sexual abuse in institutions, particularly in the Catholic Church. And I gave an annual justice lecture here in Parliament House in Sydney, and I made the call. I said that I thought the Catholic Church in Australia was no longer in a position to get its own house in order, and it required the assistance of the state. Now, you'll understand there were some people in the church who were not altogether pleased. Some thought it was typical of Father Brennan. Well, a royal commission was then instituted, and you might remember that Cardinal Pell in 2014 first appeared before the royal commission. He appeared before them several times because they were out to get him. But in the first instance, they called him to look at the so-called Ellis case here in Sydney. I'd seen something of the evidence of His Eminence's appearance on the first day and I was very troubled by it. 
and I was at Seven Hill in the Clare Valley, the Jesuit winery and retreat house. And I rose early that morning and I wrote to the Cardinal and I said, look, I know you think I'm a piece of work, but I want to offer you some advice. I think you need to apologize to this man, Ellis, and I think you need to do it in the following way. And I'm sure there were many other people who proffered him similar advice. And to give the Cardinal his due, he did make such an apology. And I thought that then indicated that there might be some room for me to proffer a little more advice as things proceeded. Well, what we had in Victoria was a situation where there was, to say the least, a grave gap between Cardinal Pell, who had been the Archbishop of Melbourne, and a gentleman by the name of Graham Ashton, who was the police commissioner. And in March 2013, Graham Ashton set up what he called Operation Tethering, which was to investigate any criminal activities of Cardinal Pell. It's since been admitted there had been no complaints in relation to Pell committing sexual abuse, but Operation Tethering was set up in 2013. That was the first indication to me that all was not well. When ultimately Cardinal Pell was charged, it became clear that there were going to be proceedings taking place in Melbourne in the county court which would be subject to a suppression order. And so the public would not get to hear day to day what was occurring. I was filled with a sense of dread, and I think I was correct. I knew there'd be a number of people writing their books, and I knew they would write from a particular perspective. And I knew that their area of forensic expertise, both in terms of criminal process and of the proceedings of the Catholic Church in conducting a procession after mass, I knew their knowledge in those areas was not great. And so I once again wrote to Cardinal Pell and I said, look, once again, I know you think I'm a piece of work, but I think given there are going to be suppression orders in place, you need to have someone like a retired county court judge who can attend these proceedings. So when the suppression orders are lifted, at least the Catholic community in Australia can be given a dispassionate analysis of what has occurred. I didn't hear back from him from some time, but then he spoke to me in his typical fashion, as I learnt later, and he said to me, I've spoken to my people, whoever they are, I've spoken to my people, and uh, they think it'd be better for you to do it, because you'd go over better with the literati and the glitterati. <laughs> so he had made that suggestion. I then thought, if I'm to discharge this function, it cannot be as an instrument of what you might call Team Pell. And so I spoke to my Jesuit provincial. I, at the time, had a position as the CEO of Catholic Social Services Australia. There was a complex arrangement under which my services to the Bishop's Conference for Catholic Social Services, there were certain times allowed for me to do other tasks which were given me by my provincial. So my provincial sought a specific formal agreement with Archbishop Mark Coleridge, the President of the Australian Bishops' Conference, and Archbishop Fisher, the Vice President of the Bishops' Conference, that I would be available to attend the proceedings so as to offer advice which was accurate to them and to others during the course of the proceedings, and that when the suppression orders were lifted, that I would be in a position to say something to the public. I then arranged, see, I had the good fortune that I had, as we say, I had read at the Melbourne Bar in the late 1970s. I'd been admitted as a barrister at the Victorian Bar. And I'm of an age now where basically most of the judiciary and the senior lawyers, they're my contemporaries or they're younger than me. 
And so I made a specific arrangement. I went to one of the leading, most respected silks at the Melbourne Bar, and I said to him, I'll be sitting in on these proceedings. I need to be able to come to your chambers whenever in order to check things through. He readily agreed. And he is a man very knowledgeable in the workings of the Victorian criminal justice system. Very, very knowledgeable. So that was the arrangement. Pell was then facing these charges in relation to events that were said to have occurred at the St. Patrick's Cathedral immediately after the solemn 11 a.m. mass. And when he was first charged, there were committal proceedings, and with the committal proceedings, it came to light that there was a situation where there'd been Operation Tethering in 2013. This individual, who I will call Jay, and we're not entitled to disclose his name or identity, and neither should we, Jay came forward and Jay made a statement to the police in June 2015, alleging that he'd been assaulted after the solemn 11 a.m. mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral on two separate occasions. He said it happened in the spring of the first year when Pell became Archbishop and the two incidents were separated by about a month. And he said that these assaults had occurred in the priest's sacristy out the back of the cathedral. So that was June 2015. He needed to amend his statement in July 2015 when certain other things came to light in terms of timing of issues, and that was fine. This is speculation on my part. The police having instituted Operation Tethering and all they had regarding St. Patrick's Cathedral was the complaint by Jay. So what they did, and they had an ever compliant media in Melbourne, particularly with the Age newspaper and the ABC, they basically placed an advertisement on Christmas Eve 2015. Anyone knowing anything that Pell was up to around St. Patrick's Cathedral during the years he was Archbishop, please come forward. Now, I can only speculate nothing of any substance came forward. I say nothing of any substance because when you hear by the end of this evening about what was said to be substantive in relation to Jay, anything else they had must have been of less coherence even than what came forward in relation to Jay. So Operation Tethering 2013, advertisements Christmas Eve 2015, they then decide in March 2016, and astute readers of the situation like Jared Henderson, who's here this evening and has just published his book on Cardinal Pell and the media pylon, uh, would be able to give you all the chapter and verse detail of the timing of these things coinciding with various events within the Royal Commission, investigating events in Ballarat and then in Melbourne. But what you had was a situation that in March 2016, the police finally decided to do something in relation to Jay, who'd made his initial police statement in June 2015. So here we were, many months later, the police, they call him into St. Patrick's Cathedral and they conduct a walkthrough of the cathedral so he can show them what's happened. And you have the map there, and if any of you have the book, you can look in page 82, there's a map, and I'll refer to the map a bit as I go. I won't give all of the numbers accurately, you've got those in the book, but I will attempt to give you the general picture. Jay's account from what occurred in what he said, first in his police statement and then in the walkthrough, was that he was a member of the choir, the choir would have 50 to 60 members, and he was a soprano. Now you'll understand sopranos, they come at the front of the choir, at the front of the procession, and they tend to be somewhat shorter than the older members of the choir, particularly the adult members. The thing about the St. Patrick's Choir is quite a number of the adult members were actually the fathers of boys who were also in the choir. 
So this choir, at the end of a solemn 11 a.m. mass, according to Jay, what happened every Sunday, every Sunday, without fail, was that the choir would engage in an internal procession where they would come from the choir stalls, they would simply walk around by the organ and they would enter the corridor which led to the sacristies. And if you measure the distance from the choir stalls to the priest's sacristy, that's about 56 steps. And so it doesn't take you much time to get there. And so what Jay said happened in relation to the first instance was that the choir is recessing down that uh, sacristy corridor and instead of turning left to continue towards the choir room, these two boys, Jay and his friend M, decided simply to go straight ahead and to enter the priest sacristy, which of course was forbidden. And he often said in his trial that one of the reasons why he would or wouldn't do things was because he was on a scholarship to St Kevin's College and he wouldn't want to be doing anything wrong. Well, here we are, peak hour in St Patrick's Cathedral, and he said that the two boys went straight into that room and they started fossicking around and they found some wine, whereupon Cardinal Pell came upon them and immediately committed this series of offences while he was fully vested. So at this time, it was said it was an internal procession. By the time we got to the trial, there'd been the committal, and at the committal, uh, before that, of course, the police had been to Rome to interview Cardinal Pell. They got there to interview him in October 2016. This wasn't just any team of police, make no mistake. The chief investigator was a man, Detective Sergeant Reed. He wouldn't be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he was on the case for a very long time. But in Rome, he was under the supervision of a very experienced police officer, Detective Inspector Paul Sheridan, handpicked by Graham Ashton. Now, at the time, we all thought Sheridan was squeaky clean. We've since learnt in the last year, since the end of the Pell proceedings, there was, for example, uh, an inquiry into the killing of two police officers. Now, there's nothing more central for police than to get it right when investigating the assassination of two police officers there'd been the substitution of witness statements without informing the prosecution or the defence. And that operation was overseen by two senior police officers, one of whom was Sheridan. And when IBAC investigated, they made a report about Sheridan and the other officer. The other officer fessed up and Sheridan did not. So that gives you a little of the picture. Mr Sheridan also was the subject of adverse reports in the Lawyer X Royal Commission, but I won't go into those details. The third person dispatched to Rome was none other than Mr Patton, who was the heir apparent to replacing Graham Ashton if Victoria were to make an internal appointment as police commissioner. And Victoria did make an internal appointment, and it was Mr Patton. So they were the three individuals dispatched to Rome to interview Pell. I labour this because Pell gave a record of interview, no holes barred, and he just laid it all out there, saying this idea with the internal procession, etc., was ludicrous. He made a number of points. He said no. After a solemn 11 a.m. mass, we have an external procession, unless it's pouring rain, but there was no evidence of that. He said, we have an external procession where we set out from the nave 
We come down the central aisle to the west door. We then process out, up past the south transept, up towards the back of the cathedral, in what's called the toilet corridor, and then back to the sacristy. <laughs> Unlike the people who wrote the books on this, I've actually walked it and measured it. It takes me about four and a half minutes to do the walk. I am not the slowest walker in the world, being over six foot four. It takes at least four and a half minutes just at my walking pace to do that route. So Jay changed his account. He said, all right, external procession. And so Jay said, well, what I did was I was at the front of the procession. Yes, we came down the central nave, went out the west door, up towards the south transept, and then I broke from the ranks with my mate and we decided to go back into the cathedral through the south transept and then down the internal corridor. And you can see what's going on in his mind. He had to get back to the narrative about going down that internal corridor. He said, so that's the route that we followed. And we went then and found the wine. But under further cross-examination and the police having come back from Rome obviously realised that they now had to run with the idea of an external procession. The problem was if he'd broken off at the south transept where the public is still there and where the choir is still in procession, then people would notice, would they not? Particularly if you're on a scholarship to St Kevin's. And so what it then became was that he and his friend at the front of the procession they went all the way to the toilet corridor and then spontaneously they decided, without speaking to each other, at the end of Mass, without speaking to each other, they decided that they would turn around and walk back through the choir to the south transept, then take the internal sacristy corridor into the priest sacristy and they found some wine, they started swigging the wine. Now, if you're two 13-year-old boys, you might ask yourself, what did you talk about as you came from the toilet corridor through the south transept and into the priest sacristy? That route takes you five and a half minutes. Just remember that, five and a half minutes. The other thing that Pell said to them in the record of interview in October 2016 was, this is ridiculous that this could have happened after mass in the sacristy. He said, it's a hive of activity. He said, there's a sacristan, a deputy sacristan, there are altar servers, there are money counters, uh, there are concelebrants. He said, go back to Melbourne and ask them. Now my point is this, just imagine your Patton and your Sheridan and you get back in your business class seats in Rome to fly back to Melbourne and you say, right, we've got to get this investigation back on track. I mean, wouldn't you think you'd turn to Reed, he was probably back in economy, but go back to him and say, now look, um, you've heard, Pell, it's an external procession and in terms of what's there in the sacristy, you, you've got to talk to some altar servers. You've got to talk to some money collectors. You've got to find out if there were concelebrants. Not a bit of it. Not a bit of it. Now, wouldn't you think Mr Sheridan, being a very experienced supervisor of police doing difficult investigations, would have said to Reed, do this. So whatever it was, it was either gross recklessness or it was malicious. Now, it'll take a public inquiry to find out which it was, but they had unlimited resources, so it was either recklessness or malice. But Pell said, look, hive of activity for 10, 15 minutes at least after the people leading the procession have come in. Furthermore, Pell said, look, this is a solemn assembly and I'm the Archbishop, 
I'm always accompanied by my MC, Monsignor Portelli. And while I'm vested, he doesn't leave me. So go figure. And as if that wasn't enough, Pell said, look, my practice always is I stop at the west door, stop at the entrance to the cathedral, and I spend time greeting the parishioners. And it can take 10, 15, 20, half an hour, whatever. But that's what I do. So you can see that there were some very difficult issues. It's all very well to say, look, in cases of child sexual abuse, believe the complainant, sure. What's it mean to believe the complainant? It means to say, we will take what you say very seriously, but it has to be scrutinised against the evidence. Now, the way Victoria Police decided to run this was, well, we won't suss out any concelebrants. Uh, we're not going to suss out any money collectors. We're not going to suss out any servers. It was, I mean, it was a joke in the trial to hear Richter cross-examining Reed, the chief police investigator, as to why he didn't interview any altar servers there in the sacristy. He said, but this related to choristers, to which it was said, well, but choristers aren't supposed to be there. It's the altar servers who were there in the sacristy, to which Reed said, no, they weren't there, they were in a different place. And anyway, Jay said there weren't any there. Now, I mean, to step right away from any of the emotion of a complainant in a sex abuse case, just take the case of a simple witness in, say, a bank robbery, who says, look, I'm a pedestrian, I was walking along, and I found this person robbing the bank. And I didn't see any bank tellers. So the police come along and say, right, pedestrian, interview all 30 pedestrians who are walking past. Did you interview any bank tellers, officer? No, because the eyewitness said he didn't see any bank tellers. Now, wouldn't you at least interview the bank tellers just to find out what normally happened in the sacristy after mass? Now, guess what? Because there were two trials, in the first trial, the jury couldn't agree, so there had to be a second trial. By the time of the second trial, the defence had said to the prosecution, there are definitely two older servers you ought to call. One was a fella, Jeff Connor, who, as I say, was anally retentive, and I suppose saved Pell in a sense. He was a server, long-time server, and he used to keep a diary scrupulously. And he would outline who was celebrating and uh, who did what during the Mass. And there was another young altar server, McGlone, who's now a barrister. And he gave evidence about what happened during a procession of those sorts. And so what was clear was that if you have this external procession, at the head of the procession, there'd be a bevy of altar servers, thurifier, cross-bearer, two people with candles, book bearer. You know, whenever this happened, you could see with the key book writers, their eyes glazed over because they don't do Catholic stuff and, you know, Catholics must be making this sort of stuff up, surely. Well, no, it's like a military procession. That's the group at the front. Then there are the 50 to 60 altar servers. Then there are the concelebrants. Then there's the master of ceremonies, Monsignor Portelli. Then there's Archbishop Pell. And then there's a mitre bearer and a crozier bearer. And so, as they come in at the end of the procession, those at the head of the procession, those seven altar servers, they wait for the mitre bearer and crozier bearer to arrive as well, if Pell's out on the steps, having divested of his mitre and crozier, and they bow to the crucifix, and then they start about their duties. Well... The evidence was that, that being the case, the prosecution had to find a six-minute period when this offending could happen in that sacristy. Six minutes with Cardinal Pell and those two boys alone. So you'll appreciate 
that there are only a few possibilities. Either it occurred in the six minutes before the altar servers bow to the crucifix, or the six minutes after they bow to the crucifix, or a significantly longer time later. From the very beginning, the crown ruled out a significant time later. There were various reasons for that, including that, of course, Christmas was coming up, so there was to be another choir practice after Mass, whichever day it was, 15 December or 22 December. So it had to be either before they bowed to the crucifix or after. The six minutes couldn't include the time when they bowed to the crucifix because you'll appreciate if Cardinal Pell was committing vile sexual acts on two boys in a sacristy, to have seven other altar servers there simply coming in and bowing to the crucifix and going about their duties, not even the prosecution suggested that. So it had to be either before or after. Well, given that there was a hive of activity, uh, the issue became whether it could be before those six minutes. And this is where those of us who saw something of both trials came to realise how absurd it was when not only the prosecution but the two majority judges in the Victorian Court of Appeal clung desperately on an answer given by the sacristan, Max Potter, aged 84 years, trying to recall what had happened those years before, that there would be a six-minute period uh, when he would allow people their private prayer time. And so the argument was, well, there's the six minutes. The problem was this. Potter said the six minutes commenced when the first altar servers came down in front of the sanctuary. And as you've heard me say, on Jay's account, from then it took him and his mate at least five and a half minutes to get into the sacristy, okay? And as for Pell, he's at the end of a procession of 70 people and the prosecution concedes he would have stayed at least a brief time on the steps greeting parishioners. So, there you are. During that six-minute period, neither Pell nor the boys could have been there. But, they said, but there's still six minutes. Might I just, I don't want to bore you with uh, what the judges said in too much detail, but I just want to give you a comparison. I've said enough to indicate why no one can seriously question the conclusion of the seven High Court judges. Let me quote to you the conclusion of the seven judges of the highest court in the land. It remains that the evidence of witnesses whose honesty was not in question, one, placed Pell on the steps of the cathedral for at least 10 minutes after mass on the 15th and 22nd of December, two, placed him in the company of Portelli when he returned to the priest's sacristy to remove his vestments, and three, described continuous traffic into and out of the priest's sacristy for 10 to 15 minutes after the altar servers completed their bows to the crucifix. Let me now give you the critical two sentences of Justice Maxwell and Chief Justice Ferguson of the Supreme Court of Victoria. In our view, taking the evidence as a whole, it was open to the jury to find that the assaults took place in the five to six minutes of private prayer time and that this was before the hive of activity described by the other witnesses began. The jury were not bound to have a reasonable doubt. The High Court was very charitable in dealing with those two senior Victorian judges, but let me just read you what the High Court said about that. The principal difficulty with the Court of Appeal majority's analysis is that it elides Potter's estimate of five to six minutes of private prayer time with the estimate of five to six minutes during which A and B re-entered the cathedral, made their way into the priest's sacristy and were assaulted. The two periods are distinct. It'd be a bit like you're turning up here this evening and someone alleges that something went on between 
Frank Brennan and another person in this room over a six minute period. But then it's established that no, there were a hundred of you here in the room with us. But then it comes to light, ah, but Frank Brennan and the person we're talking about, each of them, they took six minutes to arrive here this evening and they were on their own. Oh, all you need is six minutes. They don't have to be in the room. All you need is six minutes. That's how absurd it was. In terms of Portelli being with Pell, and this was another of those aha moments for me in watching the proceedings and reading the transcripts. As I said, I was admitted to the Melbourne Bar in 1978. And uh, I read with a wonderful man by the name of John Hassett, and he later became a county court judge. And as you are lawyers know, you know how these things work. Uh, it's all a bit of a club. Well, it turned out that the prosecutor, Mark Gibson QC, he was John Hassett's first associate when Hassett became a judge. And when I realised this, I'd been speaking to Gibson during a break of the proceedings, I went into Pell's waiting room. Now, some of you all think this is a bit irreverent, but I said, George, there is a God. He said, what do you mean? I said, Gibson, the prosecutor, I said he was Hassett's associate. I read with Hassett. I can assure you that Gibson won't do anything untoward. Now, it was a godsend for me because I was then able to sit there through the entire proceedings regardless of the static being generated by Louise Milligan and others, and just sit there putting myself in Gibson's shoes saying, right, here's a decent prosecutor. He's got to be able to find six minutes when Pell and these two boys can be in the room on their own. And he tried a number of ruses, if I may say. What really arrested my attention was this. In the first trial, he said to Portelli, um, you're a smoker, aren't you? I said, yeah. Smoke 20 a day, yep. And you've had a long morning, you know, you've waited for the cardinal and got ready and then had mass. And so may it be that, you know, um, come on, you just snuck out in your robes, but just snuck out and had a cigarette while Pell was doing whatever. He said, no, no way. In the first trial, Gibson put to the jury in his final address that this may have happened. And the defence quite properly objected. And so, in the presence of the jury, Gibson had to withdraw. In the second trial, it was even worse. He said to the jury, look, you've heard the evidence. Portelli has denied this. In fact, Portelli in the second trial said, look, it would be as bad as if his honour here in his robes went out in the street smoking a cigarette. So just not done. So he said, you've heard the evidence. And the only evidence was that no, no way that that could happen. So he went on to say, this is not evidence. It's just speculation on my part. It's just a suggestion. I mean, this is a prosecutor saying proof beyond reasonable doubt. Needless to say, the defence once again objected and he had to withdraw. That was the moment at which I realised the prosecution could not cobble together a case that made any sense. So there was the smoker. The next bit came, oh, well, you know, would there be ever times when you'd go off and do something else? And Portelli said, oh, well, if there was something else happening in the cathedral that afternoon, I might have to go and rejig the books for the readings and the sermon for that afternoon. So, in his final address, no evidence, but in his final address he says, well, we do know that every Sunday there was a low mass celebrated at 5.30 in the evening. So maybe, you know, Cardinal Pell might have celebrated that mass. Show me any archbishop anywhere who, having celebrated the solemn 11 a.m. mass, which is the end of proceedings and Monday's a holiday, uh, comes back to celebrate the 5.30 Mass. There was no evidence of it, and it just wasn't there. And so you had this situation where Gibson was desperate 
to try and find that space. Well, that's why you'll understand I was very upset with the two majority judges in the Court of Appeal because that was the opportunity to put before the public just how it was not possible that what was alleged had occurred. And yet they bent over backwards in order to find it. I'll go just a couple of minutes over because I haven't said anything about the fifth charge, which is truly preposterous. In relation to the fifth charge, Jay said uh, that these things happened in the spring about a month apart and in the same choral year. Well, Connor came forward with his diary and sure enough, the first incident had to have occurred either on the 15th or the 22nd of December. So the police said, and the prosecution said, oh, well, that's all right. Uh, let's get Connor's diary and find the next time Pell happened to be in the cathedral, which happened to be the 23rd of February. Now, you're a 13-year-old boy, you know, you go away on holidays, you come back, then a full two months at least later, it's said that this happened. What's alleged is this, that this time he says there was an internal procession and the priest who said the mass was a Father Brendan Egan. So once again, you have your altar service at the front, you have your 50 to 60 choristers, you then have uh, any concelebrants, you have Father Brendan Egan, and you have Cardinal Pell presiding, as they say, wearing some fancy clobber. What's alleged on this occasion is that uh, Jay is with his fellow choristers or whatever, is heading towards the choir room after mass and all of a sudden, Pell confronts him, pushes him against the wall and sexually assaults him and then withdraws. It only lasted a few seconds. So what's being suggested is this. Uh, if you look at the sacristy corridor, it's a dog leg. So it goes down this direction, and you then turn right a few more metres, then you turn left. So if you've got 60 or 70 people, if Jay being a soprano is near uh, the wall between the entrance to the archbishop and priest sacristy, Pell's probably back at the first part of the dog leg and he's in the third part of the dog leg. But in any event, what's alleged is that Pell, uh, being behind Egan, breaks from the pack somehow in this sacristy corridor and cuts through probably 40 or 50 people, spots this fellow, puts him against the wall, assaults him, and then presumably comes back. Mind you, Pell was, and Egan, they were only using the priest sacristy in those days, so Pell would have had no reason to go that, to that part of the corridor, unless, of course, he was wanting to pursue Jay and assault him. Now, Mr. Reed admitted under cross-examination, no one conducted any investigation whatever in relation to this incident. No one at all. Let me just share with you the compelling argument of Justices Maxwell and Ferguson as to how they were convinced beyond reasonable doubt that this had occurred. We would accept, of course, that the sight of Cardinal Pell at close quarters with a choir boy might well have attracted attention, 40 or 50 people there, but we would assume that all of the others in the corridor were intent on completing the procession and removing their ceremonial, ceremonial robes as soon as possible. In that state of affairs, it seems to us to be quite possible that this brief encounter was not noticed. And in the jurisprudential sentence of the century, at all events, the evidence once again falls well short of establishing impossibility. Proof beyond reasonable doubt has become that the defence must establish something is absolutely impossible. And explaining this, you know, Pell walking up the three parts of the dog leg in past 50 people, this is how Maxwell and Ferguson categorise it. They say, 
Jurors would know from common experience that confined spaces facilitate furtive sexual touching even when there are others in the same space. I mean, please, Your Honours, this is woke. It's really woke stuff. As the High Court said in its judgment, the Court of Appeal majority accepted that the sight of the applicant at close quarters with a choir boy might well have attracted attention. However, their honours reasoned that the others in the corridor were intent on completing the procession and removing their robes as soon as possible, including presumably Father Brendan Egan. In this state of affairs, their honours assessed that it's quite possible that the brief encounter went unnoticed. The assumption that a group of choristers, including adults, might have been so preoccupied with making their way to the robing room as to fail to notice the extraordinary sight of the Archbishop of Melbourne dressed in his full regalia, advancing through the procession and pinning a 13-year-old boy to the wall is a large one. The failure to make any formal report of such an incident, had it occurred, may be another matter. I hope I've put enough before you to establish that, of course, we must believe complainants, which means police must do their work when a complainant comes forward and says something has happened. The police must do basic policing. Place yourself on that plane in Rome, if you get a business class seat next to Sheridan and Patton, and say to them, well, you've heard what Pell said, you believe the complainant, surely you've got to go back and establish what occurred and to prove it beyond reasonable doubt. And if you can't, then there is no case to proceed. And the DPP the same. The DPP herself appeared personally in the High Court and invented evidence and invented theories. Completely inappropriate behaviour. And so what we have is a situation of something which was an extraordinary miscarriage of justice. And as I say, it is only an inquiry which eventually will establish what's the mix of malice and incompetence in what was done. But what was done was a complete and utter travesty. Thank you.